All right, so what we're going to do is, um, you're going to help me, actually, because um, this time, the thing that is going to um, help you see the reason why we're doing this is that um, the working for each of these questions, even if they're simple, they, it all, they all kind of share something in common. So let's see how we go. What was the first thing you wrote down before the answer for your, like, working? Oh, I did, like, um, 5 times 2 mm -hmm. plus 4 times 3 over 15. Right, so you kind of said, oops, here we go. It's these de denominators, right? So you wanted to get a common denominator. So you multiplied by five over here. So that gave you 10 on 15 yeah. and 12 on 15. So then once you've got that, you're like, oh, there's not much more to do, is there? Did you leave it as uh, an improper fraction or did you change it to a mixed numeral? Yeah, sure. So I was like, I'm fine with that. They didn't ask me to have it this way or the other. So that's all good, fantastic. Now this one here, I think, remember, I asked you to simplify it. What did you do to help simplify it? Well, I factorized the top. Uh-huh. And what do you get? I got x plus 2 and then x plus 3. Yep. Over x plus 3. Wonderful. Okay. And then you're like, oh, great. I can actually just cancel because this is on the denominator and the numerator. So then you just get a very simple answer, which is x plus 2. By the way, very few students notice this. And it's a kind of nitpicky thing, but it's might as well mention it, right? This thing here and this thing here, they look almost identical because you've cancelled, right? But actually, do you know how when you've got something on a denominator, the denominator is never allowed to be zero, right? Do you remember that? Like, because you can't divide by zero, the universe explodes, all that kind of thing. Um, and this is what we call a domain restriction, that x, in this case, it can't equal to... Uh, negative 3. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because if you put negative 3 in, that would make the whole thing 0, right? And these kinds of domain restrictions, they happen all the time. Even this question here, I didn't talk about it, but that's got a domain restriction too, right? x can't be a negative number because then um, you can't take the square of a negative, right? At least under our rules. So therefore, I just want to point out that this actually kind of has like this thing sort of hidden on the side, right? You don't normally need to write it, but it's worth just remembering. Okay, for this next one here, what did you do with this? We actually did this a few days ago. X to the power of 1 over 2. Yep, fantastic. So what you did was you said it's weird as a square root, but if you change it into an index, well, actually, can I ask you, why is that better? Like, usually we would prefer you to write things like this. What's the advantage here? I don't know, is it easier to differentiate? Yeah, yeah, it is, absolutely. Like, that's the thing you're being asked to do. And because it's something raised to a power, you're like, oh, I have, a, I have a rule for that, right? So I'm going to bring the power at the front. And then what's the next step you do? Um, x to the power 1 over 2 minus 1. Yeah, exactly. So we'll subtract 1 from that, which I guess would be negative a half. Strictly speaking, that's the answer. But we could probably tidy it up a little bit. Did you go further than this? I or left Just left it like that. Let's just do, just for the sake of it, what would the next step be? Like that negative, what does that mean? Do you know when you've got a negative power? Yeah, that's right. It's actually division, right? So for example, uh, I'll do a better way of writing it. <clears throat> if, I, if I said to you two cubed, right? That means um, multiply it three times, two times two times two. But if I gave you two to the negative three, that actually means divide three times. It's the opposite, yeah? So this negative means divide. So it's actually the two will be on the denominator and the x to the half will be on the denominator. So I would write that as 2 root x down there. Is that okay with you? But yeah, like it, that's fine. That's okay. All right, now last one. Now you got an answer for this. So can you just tell me what you did? Like, did you have a line of working after this or did you go straight to your calculator? I just, yeah, I went straight to my calculator. <laughs> okay, which is fine because from memory, I actually checked. I think you got the right answer. What did you get? x equals? 1.62. Cool. And of course, you can actually uh, dot, dot, dot. Well, I think I asked for three. Decimal places, didn't I? Yeah. So I can just put that there. Um, you can actually check, because you've got a calculator there, right? And we would need a calculator to handle this. You could just put this in and see if it works. 10 to the power of 1.602. Now, because we've rounded, I'm guessing it'll be like 39 something or other? Yeah, sure. The way you could know it though, and I'm guessing this is how you did it, is this is an exponential equation. We can rewrite it as x equals... Now, to turn it into a log equation, here's the way I remember it. The base that you have, oh, I chose a really bad red marker. The base that you have here, it becomes the new base in your log equation. So, 
you get base 10 of 40. And that should go straight. Is that what you punched into your calculator? Or did you do something else? I did like log 40 divided by log 10. Oh yeah, okay, so that also, uh, another color. That also works. So this is what we call the, um, the change of base rule because you can have any number there you like, two or five or etc. I actually chose 10 to try and let you be lazy because there's a base 10 button on your calculator. Yeah, do you see that? Um, let me just have a quick look. It'll be just that one right there. Oh, yeah. So if we went log 40, press okay. equals for me. Bam, oh, there you go. Yeah. So, um, and by the way, the reason why uh, your calculator has two bases on it for logs. It's got 10, and do you know what the other one is? It's E. Oh, yeah. Do you remember E is that funny number, right? It's like, um, it's something like 2.718 and extra stuff, right? So, um, mathematicians care a lot about this number. Scientists care about this number because it's scientific notation, right? If we're like, oh, how big is the mass of the Earth? It's like 6.7 times 10 to the whatever. So that 10 is what they're talking about. Okay, so you can sort of rule that off um, and underneath that I want you to make a little subheading for me which is um, exponential functions I might just abbreviate because I'm slightly lazy with now I'm gonna leave there's gonna be a couple of words that I put in here and I just want to I'll tell you what they are in a second <laughs> um, the reason why I highlighted this guy here is because we actually, over the last few lessons, we've been differentiating a lot of exponential functions. And they all kind of share this thing in common. So there's like e to the x, or e to the like, I don't know, 3x plus 1, or some other version of this, like maybe it was like 1 over e to the x plus 4, or it, it didn't matter. You saw this e happening over and over again. Uh, and that's because you probably remember that when you differentiate e to the x, it's like this really nice lazy result, right? What do you get? Yeah, exactly. You're like, cool, I don't do anything, right? Now, that's all well and good. But then the challenge comes when you say, well, hold on a second. Not all exponential functions have e as a base. For example, like I can put any number that I like there. So the question becomes, how do I deal with it when it has another? base. Right? Now, here's where we come to these, these particular questions and why I gave them to you, even though they might seem very simple. Okay? For the first three questions, even though one looks like a fraction question, one looks like an algebra question, and one looks like a differentiation question, you actually did the same thing three different ways to solve each question. Here's what I mean. When you add these two together, you sort of instinctively said, oh, I should get common denominators. Why is that? Why, like, why do you do that for? <laughs> to um, add them. Yeah, because you're like, I, I need them to kind of be talking the same language, and then you just put them together, right? Now, you rewrote them as common denominators, and then it was fine. Have a look at question two. Again, I didn't tell you to factorize. You kind of knew to factorize, though, right? Why is that? To get the same... Like yeah, like I'm looking for when I've got things to cancel, the things I cancel are common factors. So you're like, if I can find a common factor, then sweet, right? Um, so this is really interesting. When I told you to simplify this question, sometimes the factorized form is better, sometimes the expanded form is better. It just depends what you're doing, right? So in other words, you wrote this fraction just in a different way, same fraction, dressed up in different clothes, and then it was easy to get an answer. And then this is the last one here. Now you did exactly the same thing. I gave it to you in a square root and you instinctively changed it into index form because then you could treat it like a problem you've done before. Right? So in each question you basically dressed it up differently and you were good to go. As soon as you like, this is the same as this and this is the same as this but it's in an easier format.